NXT Battleground. Here it is. We got it right here. Now, before my battery died earlier, as I was really getting into it, and my battery died. I was saying, and I have to repeat myself. Before we get started, I got to explain something before we go any further. Was his show good? Yes, but it wasn't great. It was good. I'm not lying to you. And as you see from the title, was it historic? Was there history made? Somewhat yes. Somewhat no. And this is for those TNA fans who have been using their imagination to go nuts. As I've said to many people, hold your expectations. Don't lose your damn mind. I've seen so many people in my comments. I mean, I don't have that many comments, but I've seen the same thing spoken about. How we're going to get this. Let's hope we get this match. Let's get this match. Oh, I can't wait for this match. Hold your expectations. We are still dealing with two satellite companies owned by corporations. WWE is a satellite company. NXT is part of that company. TNA is a satellite company. Anthem owns that company. TKO Group Holdings owns that company. They are satellite companies. And you cannot think you're going to have what you normally would in a normal promotion. It doesn't exist. These are not promotions anymore. They are satellite companies owned by corporations. They're going to do whatever they're told to do. Now, opening, which this will iterate, if I'm pronouncing correctly, well, basically makes sense what I just said with Sexy Red. What do we get with Sexy Red? Honestly, do we get Sexy Red singing? No. Do we get her dancing with her girls? No. What do we get? Sexy Red in the middle of the ring, going like this, and just showing that ass. Well, counting on how much of ass they were showing. Because the camera conveniently wasn't exactly zoomed on her correctly. And I do believe that was done on purpose. And I do believe someone's going to get their ass in trouble for that. Because, let's make this clear, Sexy Red didn't do like other performers have done over the years when it was WWE. They would sing. They would dance. They would rap. They would do whatever they normally do. We didn't get that from Sexy Red. Sexy Red is, she is either a rap, I believe she's a rapper. I don't keep up with her, but she might be a rapper or she might be into hip hop. She didn't do none of that. She didn't rap. She didn't do no singing, nothing. She was just in motor ring, shaking her ass, and then the camera didn't fully zoom in on her ass. They did this because they wanted to get more interest in the product. A little more of this and show a lot of this titty. Let's make it clear. Sexy Red has been showing a lot of her cleavage. She's showing a lot of titty with a lot of tattoo on that mess where you could get easily confused thinking the dark marks on her chest, which are her tattoos, is her nipples and you think you're seeing a good amount of titty. That is why she's there. There is nothing like normal. When it came to Sexy Red, where she would sing, or she would dance, or she would rap, if she did it. There was none of that. She was in the ring, saying, how you doing, everybody? Bends over, starts twerking, the camera doesn't fully see her, and then we move on to the opening match. Which was the North American Championship ladder match for the women. Lash Legend. Let, let me give it to you like this. The, you know who was in the match, but... These are the people I thought that could win and the one I wanted to win. The ones I thought that could win. And I have her first, Keanu Jordan, Last Legend, and then Fallon Henley. In that order. That's what I wrote on my paper and that's what I was thinking. Because they may want to face for the first champion or they may want to heal for the first champion. So right now Lash is mainly a good girl. So she's in the same vain as Keanu Jordan. And then you think Fallon Henley is a he generally a heel now and maybe they want to go that way. Those are the three women I thought that could win. The one I wanted to win was Meechin. Because she was a veteran and it would give a little prestige to the title that someone who's been in the business for so many years, she's been there well over ten years, easily more than ten years. And she could have given it a little bit more prestige. That's what I was hoping for when it came to the ladder match and who would win the North American Championship for the women. The match, I'm going to tell you, wasn't perfect. 
It wasn't too bad. So Ruka and Keanu Jordan did exactly as I thought they would be. Because since they're both gymnasts, they were the ones who would do the most aerial there. That's what it came down to. Flat out with them. They did all the high spots most of the time. Last looked good. It wasn't too bad. She looked like she could have won it. But they chose Keanu Jordan. Now, I'm not going to tell you I hate Keanu. I don't. When it comes to her, she had something, but she's not ready. That's the reason why they threw this new title on her, to see if she could become ready. I do believe the best person out of the bunch of the three I said, Fallon Henley, Lash Legend, and Keanu Jordan, it could have been Lash. Because since she's been getting so much activity, so much airtime, and showing that she can do some good wrestling, not great wrestling, but good. I truly believe that that could have helped, but they chose not to go with the heel in Fallon Henley, not to go with the Nally kind of a face when it comes to Lash Legend because we don't see metaphor right now. Nolan Dar is not there, Mensa is not there, and Miss Jackson, she's kind of like sucking a, a well, sucking a, a <laughs> I'm trying not to sound so nasty when she's sucking on a lollipop, but you get my point. She's sucking on a sucker. That's what we got with Metaphor. And she's the only one that was the most legitimate when it wasn't playing around or wasn't part of the Heritage Cup. Next, we got the Tag Champs. And I'm not going to tell you this match was bad because it wasn't. OC versus the Tag Champs of Axiom and Frazier. Part of me kind of thought it was a good match. Yes, they got a good match out of them. But I kind of thought, well, I kind of think that could have been on NXT. But that would make no sense because they have to show all titles in Battleground. So even if the match deserved NXT standards, they couldn't do it. Now, mind you, it was not a bad match. This is a terrible match right here. This was a good match. This is a great match. This is somewhere around here. Easily right here. So it was not bad. But it kind of felt like you could have done this, put another match there that could have been important. That could have helped NXT. But then I had to think, what did they have other than that? And they didn't. So, that's what we got. Let's move on. Next match. The match I was the most surprised about. The most surprised. The underground match between Lola Vice and Shayna Baszler. When... They had to do a lot of prep for this, guys. You gotta understand, we had to wait a bit, and they were showing a lot of a lot of replays and a lot of um, like segments that was already done for a bit while they were getting the entire set done, taking down the ring, taking off the um, ring ropes, and just being bare. When it came down to that, when it started, I thought only one thing. This is what I. This is the one thing I thought. This cannot be like the other underground matches. You have two legitimate former MMA fighters. And both of them probably went for UFC at one point. They didn't just go for MMA. They went for UFC. At least one of them did. Or both. I can't remember. But when it comes to Lola Vice. And when it came to Shayna Baszler. They legitimately needed to do something that looked a lot more like MMA. They needed to make it as MMA as possible. Without actually hurting each other too badly. And we got as close as possible in the ring. It was much more close than Natalia versus Lola Vice. It was a lot more closer than what we've ever seen from the women. Or most of the men. I mean, Thorpe and Dijak, they had a decently good match. But they weren't MMA fighters. In this situation, both these women were former MMA fighters. So they know their stances. They know how to kick. They know how to punch and make it look at least good enough that if you're seeing this... Like that, you know it could really, if they meant it, and they were really angry at each other, they could actually hit each other, and they could legitimately get hurt if they w wanted to really go all out, if they meant it. So you know with these two, it felt natural. Now let's make this clear, it wasn't real. Like, they didn't really kill each other. But they made it as real as possible within the confines of them both knowing real MMA fight 
fight kick techniques. Look, Shayna Baszler was doing judo throws. And you're seeing basically as many body shots as possible from Lola Vice. She was not doing hands open. She was doing full hands closed, hitting the body as much as possible. Now, I'm not telling you that was 100% real hard hit, but it was pretty damn good for what it was. Seeing they were just pounding each other, which does happen in MMA. When you get someone down, you try to smash them in the face. They were doing that. We got a good amount of back fists. We did see that they also had to put a little bit of pro wrestling like we normally do. The pantomime must be in there. And we see them do what they normally do outside as well as inside. And at one point, I don't know why Shayna Baszler decided to start whooping some other people's asses because she was getting frustrated. That is the reason why she lost the match. But it was understandable that she just lost her rage and she just was so distracted. That's one of the reasons she lost the match. But that... One bit there, I must say, made the match flow well, even though it felt awkward at the end. But that was at the end, not in the beginning, when she started beating up on everybody, men and women alike. It felt natural, the majority of it. In the sense that two women who know how to throw down, threw down as close as they could without really hurting each other too much, trying to make it look like if it was a real MMA fight when they were trying to do rounds in the octagon, one of them would get tired and they would try to throw kicks at each other. They legitimately did throw kicks at each other, but not very hard. We got a match that I honestly enjoyed. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but this is my point of view. You guys tell me below. Lola Vice won, and now the question is, where does she go from here? And hell, where does Shayna Baszler go from here? Because Shayna has not looked good for quite a while. This is something I'm very concerned about. Because when it comes to Shayna, she has been jobbing a lot. And I don't know if this really is helping her character at all. Next, the North American Championship. Joe Coffey versus Uma Femi versus A. West Lee. With Gallus at ringside. Let me give it to you like this. After the match, I mean, it took a while for them to reset the, the, the ring back up. This match was the, I'll give it to you like this. The underground match was the third best match of the night. It just was. It was the third best match. Second best match for me was this one. Seeing Wes working with Joe as well as Oma, Oba gave us several questions. But also simple answers. One. Question. Why they continue putting Obafemi in three. Basic. Excuse me. Triple threats as much as possible. Do they believe that Oba is still not ready to be able to just. Show how dominant he is. Or do they believe that he. Is way more suited for having multiple people to deal with. That's a question. And a possible answer right there. Next. Joe Coffey. Is Joe Coffey someone you can legitimately think could win a title? From his ring work, he's fine. But his character work with Gallus, you wonder. Because he never gets anywhere, even though he throws down pretty hard with his own blows. Finally, when it comes to Wes Lee and his back. This was the most important question anybody could ask when it comes to Wes Lee. How well can his back handle the situation. He's not much better than Randy Orton. He had to have back he had to have fusion in his back. I think at least two or three um, vertebrae in his back had to be fused for him to be able to function normally and no more pain. The question was could he still move around in the ring as fast and out of control like he normally does. Desmond Xavier, the former Desmond Xavier, my boy from the Rascals, proved that he could take a licking. He was thrown around like a damn lawn dart by Obafemi. And then thrown into the ring post multiple times by Joe Coffey. They legitimately were trying to prove that Wesley can still go. That's what this major triple threat was. Next to try and see if Obafemi can handle the situation with two smaller opponents, one very agile opponent, and one that's a th pretty much as solid as him when it comes to your coffee, 
but to see how the crowd will react to him. How does he work the ring? Was he working the ring well? No, but it wasn't great, but it wasn't bad. He's still new in the business. I think he still needs work. That's the reason why he's still being put in these triple threats. That's what I think is going on with him. When it comes to him, he still needs work, but they are showing that he can handle himself with multiple people. He can handle himself decently well with a big guy, but not great yet. Like when he was working with Joss Briggs. The question is now that he won his match, which he did because of distraction outside because of Gallus. And we got Wes doing a healer out there to try and stop them, which he did. He was the one that just got wiped clean. But he literally was decided to go meteor onto his shoulders. And that is Obafemi. And Oba picked him up and literally drove him into the damn mat. I mean, anyone else who would be driven into that, they would be hurt and they would feel it. He took that thing like a freaking champ. But now, Obafemi won. But the question is, where did it go with Obafemi now? Who is he going to deal with? Is he going to be dealing with people from Out the Mud? Is he going to be dealing with the new two other guys that come in that look like Out the Mud? Who is next for Obafemi? That's a big question. Next. And I'm not doing the next match. I'm doing the final match. And then we're going to the next, the second to last match. That's the big question. And the big answer. Now, NXT Championship. Ethan Page versus a Trick Williams. Now, let's make this clear. When it comes to Ethan, I've seen him for multiple years when he was part of the North. I've also seen him when he was in AEW. And I do believe I saw him even earlier than that. Maybe around 2014 or 13. What, before he joined T TNA. I think I might have saw him on the Indies. He might have actually been on the National Wrestling League. That was... I did do a review of it. I do not believe he was on Raw. Reality of Wrestling. I've never seen him there. But I do believe when I did look at National Wrestling League, KC... I think I might have saw him there as well as saw him with um, MJF. Because that's the first time I saw MJF. I don't know about anyone else. I saw MJF on National Wrestling League. KC. Uh, there's, I think their channel's gone. But if you ever saw KC, National Wrestling League, you would see him with the same scarf walking there. And I do also believe I did see Ethan Page then as well. I thought there was something about him. It wasn't just the mustache. <laughs> but I've always thought that Ethan Page was interesting. I always thought that Ethan Page, when he was in the North, was interesting. When he became Karate Man, <laughs> he was interesting. And when he went to AEW, he didn't become interesting anymore. He became flat. And then he worked with Scorpio Sky. And then he wasn't working with Scorpio because he got hurt. And then he was working with Matt Hardy and Jeff. And then he went flat again. And then he's now ended up in NXT. Did he do a great job getting people interested? Yes. Was his new music good? Um, wasn't bad. I'm not going to tell you it was bad, bad. But it wasn't bad at all. For me personally, whatever music Ethan comes out, he's going to take as much advantage of that song and try to make it his own. But essentially... We got what we got. Trick comes out. We have the match. Now, let me give it to you like this. If anybody thought that we were going to get someone from TNA coming in after the match was over, you didn't get it. I thought maybe we might see a new challenger for Trick Williams, but it's a good possibility that Ethan Page will still be messing with Trick after Thursday. After, not Thursday, Tuesday. You see I'm getting TNA mixed up with NXT. <coughs> Excuse me. Allergies. But the question is going to be, if Ethan's not finished with Trick Williams, how far are they going to go with this into the next pay-per-view? I don't know. But it was a good match. I liked how Ethan worked with Trick. Trick did a decently good job working with him, even though Trick is still... Look, Ethan's been in the business 17 years. He's worked in every kind of promotion there is. 
And Trick is still very young in the business, no more than maybe two nearing three now. He's 17, 17 and maybe three years nearly. There is a gap. But you can see potential in Trick Williams and how over he is, how the fans get motivated by him, how they motivate Trick, how he plays into the crowd, and how also Ethan played into the crowd. It showed that both of them are good and they have a not incredible great chemistry, but good chemistry. And in the end, we know Trick won. But do I believe it's over? No. I don't know if it's over. And honestly, if it is over, who are you going to have Trick William go up against next? Because you don't have anyone majorly developed right now unless you're going to bring someone down from you to Raw SmackDown to deal with Trick. And it can't be Carmelo Hayes again. Because Carmelo should not come back to deal with Trick Williams. He should be dealing with LA Knight. Finally. This is, what we were worried, this is what we were waiting for. This is what I was waiting for. This was the one thing I cared about. Yes, I cared about Ethan working with Trick. But this match is what I was waiting for. The TNA Knockouts Champion, Jordan Grace, versus the NXT Champion, Roxanne Perez, for the NXT Championship. I'm giving you two... I'm, what I loved about this match, and it was a damn good match... But I gotta ask you, if you watch the match, who is bleeding? Was it Jordan bleeding on a shoulder or was it Jordan bleeding from a nose? I don't think it was. There was something on on Roxanne Perez's arm. I don't think she got cut. And I don't think Jordan got cut, but it looked like there was blood in the ring. Or it could have been lipstick. I don't think so. But it looks like someone might have been hurt. Jordan at one point looked like she got smeared over her face. Either that might have been Roxanne Perez's lipstick, which wouldn't make any sense because her face wasn't smeared. Or maybe Jordan's nose started to bleed. Or Roxanne, for that matter. Or maybe on the shoulder of Jordan or Roxanne. There, there might have been blood. I don't know. But Jordan comes out looking great. Roxanne comes out looking great. The one thing I loved the most, which was the most important thing to me, was Booger T and Vic Joseph. This is the thing that AEW does not do very well. TNA does it decently well. And that's where I would say at least when it comes to WWE and TNA, the commentators are the ones who motivate the people at home to care. Because hearing these... Well, let me give you like this. People of AEW do not understand that the fans need to be told who is who. You being told by a commenter, you should go and watch this on YouTube. That's not my job to go watch it on YouTube unless I want to do something extra. The one's job to make me interested in this person is the commentators, is the ones who are booking. And when you heard Vic Joseph talk to Booger T, hey, how do you feel about this? You're a former champion here, but you're also a former champion TNA. That gave context to how important this was to Booger T. Look, we know Booger T went to TNA at one point. We know this. It's been known for years. But this is the first time it's ever been mentioned on WWE, well, TKO WWE now, but ever on this platform's commentator team. It's never been done. This is the first time someone who is from the rival promotion that's come in to face the one who's a champion we get a perspective that is very unique. And he was already torn because, look, he loves Roxanne. Roxanne is not just an ordinary wrestler that he trained. I think he cares so much about Roxanne, not just to see her succeed. He sees her like family. Look, Roxanne started wrestling at 14 at Reality Wrestling. And for him, it is an important thing. He cares about Roxanne. He cares about her as Roxy. He, he probably loves her like a little daughter. And seeing her succeed, got to give him joy. But knowing, and I'm sure he knows, he's watched the product of TNA, Impact Wrestling at one point, how Jordan Grace changed from being a strong pro wrestler, who is a body, not bodybuilder, but powerlifter, to what we see now that is a powerlifter, a bodybuilder, and who has gone through multiple promotions. Look, 
I know she's gone through at least how many different promotions. I know she went from C A um C Z W A A W I believe. Um Shimmer. I know she went there once. New Japan, I think she might have no, not New Japan. Um uh, what was the other one? I can't remember. There was another one when she was with Jonathan, her husband, on another promotion. There's a lot of promotions out there. I can't remember them all. But I know she'd been to at least six promotions working their, working their talent and even being a champion in one of those promotions. So seeing her here, he was worried, even though he probably knew who was going to win. But the point is, he acted worried. It helped in the character development of the entire match. Remember, the match has to have its own character. The crowd was chanting Jordan. The crowd was chanting for Roxanne. There was a split. Then it started just chanting Jordan. There was one point people were saying, we believe when it comes to Jordan possibly winning. The match was actually quite good. The best match I've seen NXT ever put on. And since it was someone who had been in the business longer than Roxanne Perez has been in the business, it works so well. But here's where you get like, oh, come on. Why? It had to happen. I told you, keep your expectations in check. Do not go outside your expectations. We are still dealing with two companies that are owned by corporations. These are satellite corpor companies that are owned by corporations. And there's no way they're going to let their champion, Jordan Grace, win against Roxanne, but they're not going to deny the other company and say, well, we got, we're not going to let your champion just job out. We're going to need someone from your company, someone that could come over here and cause a distraction. One of our own people, you have one of our own people currently. And they say, yeah, could we have her over here once? They say, oh, fine. You know who I'm talking about, Ash of Elegance. Tatum Praxley. Give it to you like this. Now, many people are going to say, well, Tatum grabbed the, the, not NXT champion, but the TNA title, grabs it, Ash tries to grab it back, Jordan jumps out of the ring, and pretty much Jordan clean clocks both of them, and that is the main reason she was so distracted that she lost the match, because she should have won it. I'm not surprised that you guys are going to start fantasizing that possibly Tatum Paxley will be going over to TNA. There's going to be someone's going to say it. You're going to hear it, and you're going to hear them say, oh, Tatum's going over there. Okay, that might be interesting. And then you're going to hear someone say, oh my gosh, or in this case, oh my God in heaven, why are we getting Dana Brooke back? Fuck her. We don't need her. You might get her back. This is what I said. Keep your expectations in check. Because you still don't know how far they're going to go with this. Will it be women? Will it be men? We don't know who is actually crossing over. Hearing the reports that WWE wants to do more than just one collaboration with TNA. Fine. But we still don't know the terms of that collaboration. We don't know how far they'll go with it. And we don't know if it's exclusive for the women only. And it may not be for men. This could be what it could be, or it could be something entirely different. It could be an entire faction from WWE going over, well, NXT, TKO, going over to, you don't know if it's going to go in the impact zone. You don't. But we do know this, that there is going to be more collaboration. But I state this clearly to you. I'm going to say it again. Put your expectations in a little box and be patient. Do not fantasize like crazy and then get angry afterward because you guys could not stand that you saw Ash of Elegance on Battleground instead of seeing like Rosemary or seeing like maybe Gazelle Shaw or seeing like Havoc or seeing one of the other one, Marsha Slamovich. Hold your expectations down because you do not know how this is going to end. As I told you guys, do not underestimate this not going great. And even if it did go great, 
You don't know how far this is going to go. But that's just me. Peace.